On this episode of What's Going On With Shipping, Longshoremen and West Coast Ports contract expired. What now? I'm your host, Sam McCoglana. Welcome to this episode of What's Going On With Shipping. If you're new to the channel, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell, so be alerted about new videos as they come out. Well, today's July 1st, 2022, and that means the contract between the International Longshoremen and Workers Union on the West Coast and that of the Pacific Maritime Association, which represents all the West Coast ports, has officially expired. And the two organizations are continuing to work, but negotiations continue for a new contract. So what does this mean going forward? Let's take a look at the history of this and then what is going on right now. So here's the latest story on G Captain. This is a uh, Bloomberg story posted yesterday by Augusta Savara, where she talks about how the ports are bracing for the end of this union contract. And a couple of key things she makes note of in this, the ILWU uh, and the more than 70 employers represented by the Pacific Maritime Association had started this negotiation back on 10 May. And this impacts all the labor workers, 22,000 labor workers on the West Coast across 29 ports up and down the entire West Coast from California, Oregon, and Washington. And while the contract technically expired on July 1st, they have both announced that they will continue working while negotiation goes up. And Augusta makes a couple of points in here too. Back in November, the ILWU declined an offer to extend their contract through July, 2023. Now understand they had initially had a contract renegotiation back in 2015 and they negotiated and they pushed that back for six years. And 2014, 2015, when the last issue was happening, we were coming off the 2008 recession. There was a lot of issues at play. And so everybody agreed to push it back at that time. But then in November, when PMA, the Pacific Maritime Association, I'll talk about what they are specifically, when they made the offer to the ILWU back in November, it was within the ILWU's best interest not to do that. They're in a driver's seat right now. Labor is in the driver's seat, obviously, because of issues with profitability of the ocean carriers. We're getting Q2 reports right now that best quarter ever for the ocean carriers. They are in the smart move to kind of go on and keep pushing this on. Now, what we're seeing right now is strikes taking place in places like Germany, where labor strikes are really impacting offload of cargo in Northern Europe. And this report goes on here and talks about the potential possibilities. Goes on down here with the widespread issues. Labor impasses are contributing to supply chain disruptions worldwide. We saw it in Korea, where truckers had gone on strike. We're seeing protests in Germany, the UK, and Argentina. Now, the President has been involved. Matter of fact, the Secretary of Labor, uh, Marty Walsh, has been involved. We just had the, the president come out to the West Coast to talk about this. And there's always the potential, should a strike happen, for the president to invoke what's called Taft-Hartley, which is an 80-day cool-down period since everyone back to work until there can be an attempt to do it. And one of the things we saw is when these things have happened in the past, that has been done. So we see that at the same time, this story from Greg Miller, uh, California ports piling up again, too many containers sitting too long. Uh, at the height of last year's, will Christmas be canceled? Supply chain freak out the ports of LA and Long Beach with the Biden administration backing proposed a highly controversial fee on import containers. We are literally seeing a repeat of last year, the second half this year. And this is the danger that we're seeing, except what's different about this year is the following. So last year, if you remember, we had those huge backlogs off the port of LA and Long Beach, massive number of ships waiting, and we had massive congestion. This year, the reason we're seeing congestion in the ports is because cargo is not being moved out of the ports because consumer demand is not as robust as it was last year. However, we're still seeing a flow of goods across the ocean like never before. And more importantly, Shippers are rerouting their cargo to avoid LA and Long Beach and go to other ports. This is why the congestion won't be just off LA and Long Beach. It will not be at the level we saw at LA and Long Beach. You're not gonna see hundred ships off LA and Long Beach, but what you're gonna see is congestion off LA Long Beach, Charleston, Savannah, New York, New Jersey, Houston. That's where we have the potential to see this. And most ominous is that the fact that containers are piling up in the ports. Literally, we are back to where we were in November with the container dwell fees. 
And that's the big issue. This chart right here shows you the number of import containers dwelling nine plus days at the port of Long Beach. And you can see where it was almost at 30,000 back in November. Well, we're over 20 something thousand now. And, and this is causing a lot of problems. And it's even worse when you look at the LA numbers, where the LA numbers since the beginning of the year have just gradually and systematically gone up. And the argument here, it's all about rail, and it's all about road, getting the goods off. But the problem isn't the rail and roads, in my opinion. It's warehousing and the slowdown in consumer purchasing uh, power, which means they're buying less. And that means that goods are just going to pile up in the ports because it doesn't cost them anything to leave them in the ports. That's literally what we're seeing. And that means that labor, go back to the strike issue here and the contract renegotiation, is in a great position because the only way to make ports more productive is to improve the supply chain throughput. And one of the ways to do that is through automation, the A word. And that is the word that the ILWU doesn't like because they associate automation with layoffs and firing of people, even though I would argue that's not the case. So the history of this is very much prevalent. And you really can't understand the ILWU and the Pacific Maritime Association without understanding the fact of the strike back in 1934, what is known as Bloody Thursday. Ironically, today we're calling today Bloody Friday because shipping stocks have taken a massive hit today. But on July 5th, 1934, nearly, you know, we're almost at the anniversary of this event, you had a massive strike take place. Over 12,000 longshoremen up and down the West Coast of the United States. Matter of fact, July 5th is always a holiday for the ILWU to commemorate those who were killed in the strike by uh, police. And this site here from uh, uh, University of Washington is dedicated to this. I'll have it in the show notes for you to take a look at. But it talks about that effort to unionize the dock workers in 1934, thanks to the, uh, the uh, National Labor Relations Act, they were able to do that. And so the West Coast has become a unionized area. And because of the number of ports on the West Coast, remember, you don't have a lot of big ports on the West Coast, LA Long Beach, Seattle, Tacoma, Oakland, Portland, and then lesser extent down to San Diego, Port Wainimi, and a few others up and down the coast. Basically, you, you really are constrained in the number of ports, and that's why unionization on the West Coast take took such a, a, a major impact. All right, let's go to Gene Soroka talking about this on Bloomberg TV. So this is the interview uh, Bloomberg TV did just the other day with Gene Soroka. So I'm going to let this play, and you can hear his view specifically on what's happening regarding the West Coast ports and the strike uh, or potential of a strike, I should say. Give me the color, what's happening, we're crunch time here, how are the contracts looking? Well, first, Alex, good morning. The contract will not be signed by expiry on Friday, and tradition history has shown us just that. But we've got experts on both sides of the table negotiating, and each understands their importance to the U.S. economy. We're giving them as much room as they need to negotiate, and the rest of us are just moving all this cargo through the nation's largest gateway. So Gene is always the master of calmness. I mean, the, the world can be on fire, but Gene is, okay, everything's good, everything's working. And in truth, it is. I mean, the labor, labor negotiations are ongoing. We're hearing that PMA and ILWU are sitting down and talking, which is good. The problem is, what are those controversial issues and will they come up with a resolution to them? Gene, if the contract lapses and there's no extension, are strikes possible, are strikes allowed? Because that's what's making everybody nervous. Yeah, anything's possible, but it will not happen. Uh, OK, anything's possible, but it will not happen. The Gene's guarantee there is great. It's fantastic. It's what everybody wants to hear, that there's not going to be a strike or, or a slowdown and everything like that. However, once the contract expires, the no strike, no lockdown is gone now. And, and it is possible. But and that's what gives a lot of people concern. And I know I'm going to get notes from everyone from the ILWU and the PMA about this. But understand, as it's the uncertainty that causes problems. And as long as this contract negotiation is hanging out there, there's uncertainty. Both sides put out a joint release after meeting directly with President Biden and Labor Secretary Marty Walsh two weeks ago. To my knowledge, this was the first time a sitting president met with both sides during an active contract negotiation. And 
can I be clear? That doesn't give me a lot of confidence right there. The fact that this is the first time a president met with a active contract negotiation, this indicates the concern of this issue and the absolute criticality of it. And the administration has been watching this very closely mm -hmm. ever since they came into office. So the dock workers who've been averaging six days a week since the pandemic began will be out on the job, moving all this cargo, and the companies have an awful lot to deliver to their customers. That chart's a really good one to highlight for something right here. This is showing the spot container rates. And what you're hearing is container rate, spot rates are falling. But what you notice here is they're actually plateauing. And they're plateauing out at a pretty high level. If you go back again to early COVID, you know, June, September of 2020, uh, you're looking at, you know, for basically Shanghai to Rotterdam, you're looking at, you know, about $2,000. Now it's about 9736 Shanghai to Los Angeles, which was just under $4,000 is double that. And then, of course, the composite, which takes all these measures, was right around 2000 and it's holding about 7,600. It's the plateauing that's the most interesting thing because we're also seeing at the same time right now, ocean shippers are blank sailing. They're canceling voyages to keep rates up at an artificially high level. And that's going to be something that's going to draw the attention of the Federal Maritime Commission and investigative bodies to see whether or not there's some sort of price fixing going on. A lot of factors going into all this. The June numbers will rival our best June ever set just last year. And we're matching box for box our record setting 2021. We've got to continue to work around the clock on the rail cargo. About 40% of every ship coming in has intermodal boxes on it. We've got to double down our efforts with the Union Pacific and Burlington Northern Santa Fe to get that cargo out into the domestic economy. But again, our workers are going to be out there. There's work for everyone who wants it, and we got to keep this American economy moving. The downline indications are that bookings will continue to be strong from Asia, and while some retailers are talking about high inventory levels, the products that we're going to be seeing second half of this year look very different. Yep. They're seasonal, back to school, fall fashion, and the all-important retail holiday season goods. That point Gene makes at the end there is really, really important, is that even with high inventories right now in retailers, and we saw great stories about this with Target and a few other retailers out there, the seasonality of a lot of commerce coming in in the third quarter is important for the holiday season. And that's going to drive a lot of this. And the problem is going to be the congestion in the ports. He alluded to issues with the rail lines. But understand the problem stems from the port to the warehouses. It is a systematic issue. And go back to the chart I showed you with the increasing amount of containers blocked in in LA and, and Long Beach. What that's telling us right now is that the issue here is just the pure volume. If you get to the congestion point where you cannot efficiently move boxes, it becomes very difficult to get the containers out of the terminal over to the warehouses. And this is where automation comes in. This is the aspect of automation that the unions and the PMA are going to be fighting over because what they want to do with automation isn't so much purely, you know, autonomous ports, you know, no humans involved, you know, automatic cranes, automatic bomb carts moving the containers around. That's not what we're talking about. But one of the big things in automation is data. And that's going to be a big issue that's going to cause a lot of consternation between the ILWU and the PMA. And, and the biggest bone of contention right now has to do with the ability of the ports of Long Beach and LA and West Coast ports to move containers efficiently. Just this past uh, last month, this report came out from World Bank Group of S&P Global about container port performance index. So they took the 370 container ports around the world using a series of criteria and ranked them. And so what you get in here, and it talks all about this, is, is how they did this, the method to do it. This is the index right here, number one port in the world, King Abdullah port, uh, Salah, uh, Hadman port, Yangshan. So you get all these ports ranked from one to 370. And when you go through this list and you get to the end of the list at 369 is the port of Long Beach. And at 370 is the port of Los Angeles. Now, I, I have issues with how this port, uh, how this thing is 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 ranked and, and, and 
done. But it is a good indication that one of the things we're seeing is we need change in the ports. We need more efficiency in the ports. This is not being critical of the ILWU and those who work there. They have moved more cargo over the past two years than ever before. They have died moving this cargo because of COVID. I want to fully acknowledge what they have done. Don't take this as a criticism of their work. But what we're talking about here is the efficiency of moving cargo through the ports. And that involves data, involves the terminals, involves the ports, involves everything. There's a lot that goes into this. And I think we need to be looking at all these factors. And with that, I'll send you over to two sites to, to follow. One is the ILWULongshore.org. This is the website of the ILWU Coast Longshoremen Division. Uh, moving cargo since 1934, they talk about this, how many containers they move, how many workers they have, and it's a great uh, site to get an idea about what is this organization and how they represent this. Understand, longshoremen were treated like crud for most of their history, and they've done a great job of protecting their workers, and there's concern that they're going to lose jobs for workers. I disagree with that. I actually think what you're gonna see is transition jobs out from traditional longshoremen jobs into new jobs as we change and update the ports. These, you know, it takes 10 years to update a port. We saw that with uh, the port in Long Beach, the Long Beach Container Terminal. That one is need to be done. And let's be clear, the ILWU has an important say, and obviously the labor has a big say in many things. And then you need to look over at the Pacific Maritime Association. This is the PMA's website, uh, pmanet.org where they talk about this and they actually have an entire site uh, or section de devoted to the 2020 negotiations uh, with a statement by Jim McKenna, the president and CEO of the PMA. And remember the PMA is representing basically the terminals and the shipping companies. And obviously these two have a kind of, uh, you know, mutual uh, relationship between them. Uh, it's really important that they work together and one of the things that's very clear is, and you can see this in their annual report, is how the ILWU and labor has increased over the years. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a good job, the ILWU. They pay good benefits and they got good money. But again, it's also expensive to live in ports and, and to be here. And it's a very labor intensive work. It's a really dangerous job too, in many cases with containers, a lot of moving parts here. It's a, it's a really dangerous uh, job to do and absolutely essential. And so what we want to see happen here is a negotiation between these two. We want to avoid a, a shutdown, a lockdown, a slowdown, anything like that. But right now, July 1st is hit. And now we're in that period where anything can happen. And I think that is the thing we need to remember more than anything else going forward. We will, of course, on this channel, keep monitoring this and keep you abreast of that information. So uh, with that, I just want to take one moment here and, and say something that I usually don't add to these videos, but I, I just want to take a moment here. Those of you that have viewed this channel for a long time know that I have a, uh, you know, a staff here at uh, what's going on with shipping. And many of you have seen Peanut, my son's dog, a golden doodle that will periodically rear her head in the background. What you don't typically see is sitting behind me is Macy. Macy was my blue tick hound, had her for 15 years. And she always sat right over here, right behind me, down in her bed back there. I'll raise my camera a little bit so you can see there a little bit. There you go. And usually when I did my broadcasts, every time she was there, usually sleeping, usually snoring, sometimes passing gas. It made it a little hard sometimes for me to do uh, uh, my broadcast with her in the background at times. So she was always there. And uh, this is my uh, first broadcast without her snoring in the background and uh, being there with me. So uh, I, I posted this the other day and it was yesterday. And I, I just want to thank everybody for the very kind words and uh, sympathy for it. If you had a dog and you, you know what a dog is like, I had it for 15 years. And uh, it, it's going to be a little different for me going forward. It's my favorite picture of her. She, she's always so happy. So that was just before I fed her. She, she's a 15 year old dog who would not move at all for anything. When you fed her, she reverted back to a puppy. And that, that was always her when it was time uh, to eat. So 
I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, please take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Give it a thumbs up, share it across social media, do whatever you need to do with it. I, I don't care at this point. But uh, it's it's uh, hopefully you found it a uh, useful video. So uh, until our next video, this is Sal signing off.